I know that you have been involved in the Eat Lancet Commission and the development of the planetary health diet, the, the first version, and then more recently, the second version. Can you remind us all what the Eat Lancet Commission was kind of engaged to do and what the, the planetary health diet sort of stands for? This process started back around 19, 2016 something, when I think a lot of people were concerned about what was going on from a climate change standpoint, and other people were concerned about the diet and health and much of the world increasing incidence and mortality from non-communicable diseases. And so basically, one of our younger colleagues in Sweden got some funding from the Wellcome Trust through a foundation in Sweden to take this issue on. How can, Basically, the question is, how can we feed a world that will have close to 10 billion people by 2050 diet that is both healthy and sustainable? And so that wasn't at all clear to me, or I think pretty much anybody at that time, is it even possible? Possible to do that? And if so, how could we do that or at least come close to doing that? So this did allow us to bring together 35 scientists from 17 different countries representing many different disciplines, including not just nutrition, earth climate sciences, agricultural sciences, social sciences. And so we took that on. And after trying to figure out how to take on such a complicated question, where do we start? And so we decided to start by defining a healthy diet with the assumption that everybody should be able to have a healthy diet. So we looked at that issue piece by piece, going through all the major food groups, grains, fruits, vegetables, dairy, beef, pork, added fats, etc. And when we put all those pieces together. It's there as the first table in the initial report that we published in 2019. We ended up with a diet that, first of all, was flexible because we could see that humans are adaptable and that's good. So we tried to indicate quite a bit of flexibility and including that people can be a healthy vegan if they want to. You can be a very unhealthy vegan as well. But if you're careful about food choices, you can have a healthy vegan diet, making sure you get some vitamin B12 that will not be there in a strictly vegan diet. But the end was something that was predominantly emphasizing plant protein sources and healthy sources of fat, whole grains, as we talked about already, fruits and vegetables. And in fact, when we put all the pieces together, it ended up with a description of the traditional Mediterranean diet, which was quite convenient. That's not where we started. But then we basically have invoked a huge amount of evidence and, and studies from the Mediterranean diet, uh, which among all the traditional dietary patterns has been far more extensively studied than anything else. So when we put that together, we basically, somebody said, what are we going to call this? So we decided to call it the planetary health diet. So that's basically what it is. And then when we published that, we did realize that people would want to have an update in a few years because the field is moving forward pretty rapidly. And at a minimum, they'd want to know, you know, does this really work? And are there new findings that would cause us to change the description of a healthy diet. So we did publish that update just last month in October, and a lot more evidence has accrued, but basically supported the description of what I mentioned already. So I think we had much more confidence in those numbers, those ranges. But then we also had a big literature that's new where we have taken diets and scored them according to their adherence with the Mediterranean type diet or the planetary health type diet. We've done this earlier with the Mediterranean diet, but here we could create a planetary health dietary index. How well does someone or a whole population adhere to this dietary pattern? And then look at how that relates to outcomes. So let us go back to our data starting in 1980 from our study and then score everyone's diet, update their score every four years, and then look at that score in relation to overall mortality and all major causes of death and lots of other outcomes now. And we do see that the that score does work quite well. It, it's not surprisingly, it's correlated with the healthy alternative index and Mediterranean dietary index. There has been a convergence here, which is in some ways, that's what science hopefully does is converge. You get inconsistent numbers, but you collect more data and you along and converge towards something where you're quite confident. So we have at this time great confidence that this will be a general direction to go. And then after defining the healthy diet, we looked at the question, could we produce this for everybody 
close to 10 billion people and stay within planetary boundaries. And the planetary boundaries are, what are the realistic limits on how much greenhouse gas emissions could we emit and be sustainable, emit from the food system? How much water is available? How much land is available? How much fertilizer can we use without totally polluting our environment? And it worked out that we could stay within planetary boundaries if we Follow this diet pretty closely and also reduced food loss and waste and made some improvements to agricultural efficiency. But it's a tight fit. There wasn't much wiggle room there. Do it, but barely do it. And it's going to take the efforts of almost everybody to, to make this happen. And what's the deadline to make that happen? Well, our target milestone was 2050, but from a global standpoint on greenhouse gas emissions, we have a much shorter deadline than we did before, partly because we haven't, as you know, uh, first of all, I should say that greenhouse gas emissions, with all these other boundaries, they're all important. But this one is greenhouse gas and climate change is really important because a lot of the changes that are happening are not going to be reversible ever or within hundreds of years if we don't make a course correction now. And the food system contributes about 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions. 70% is fossil fuels. So we need to eliminate fossil fuels as fast as we can, despite what people may be hearing from Washington. And and, but if we, if, even if we do that and we don't actually reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the food system, we still can't stay on track and end up where we need to be. So these are both necessary, but neither is sufficient. And we had 11 different modeling groups working on this, and they've done other work looking at climate change. It's pretty clear that what we do within the next decade will be very important in terms of being ending up where we need to be at the end of the century, which seems like it's a long way, but yeah, my grandkids will be alive then. They'll likely be alive at that point in time. It's not. It's It's really not so far down the road. Did you guys look at the policy changes that would be required? In order for this to this change to take place by by 2050, presuming that this it's not going to be enough for consumers to, you know, drive that shift completely by themselves. Yes, almost for sure, it will take policy changes, but it's also pre become pretty clear to me working on trans fat elimination or smoking reduction that it's rare that we get just totally everything working because we have wise, generous, compassionate rulers who decide to do the right thing. It usually just doesn't happen that way. In fact, it's going in the opposite direction right at the moment in this country. And we've seen happen is a lot of this does start from the grassroots up. And even though eventually we do need policy changes, you can do a lot before the policy changes. And also the policy changes often happen because of changes, number one, showing it's possible, and number two, there's societal pressure to do the things that need to be done. Like trans fat elimination, by the time it was actually banned in the United States, it was basically gone because of uh, local and regional pol actions and policies. So these are things that need uh, need to be done at all levels, being as fast as possible. That feels good at an individual level to know that you you can vote with your dollar and make make a difference here as well. Yeah, it's what we do purchase with our own dollar. But it's also being, I think I'd like to recruit a little, some soldiers here to help push. If you're working at a place, really advocate for healthy offerings there, say in the cafeteria, in the canteens. If you're a physician, we've been missing in action, actually, that we haven't been guiding our patients on healthy, sustainable diets or healthy, even healthy diets and using our waiting rooms, our food services as places where we can be transmitting information and, and showing really good examples of healthy and sustainable diets. So we actually work quite a bit with the Culinary Institute of America to help chefs get aboard this agenda. And a lot of them are, which is encouraging. What were the, the kind of biggest or best criticisms or pushback that you received after the first edition that you and your committee sat down and kind of deliberated over and perhaps addressed in the second version? Well, we expected that the beef industry would push back, and I can say we were not disappointed. And they claim, oh, there's a benefit. You have to have animal protein to be healthy. It's clearly not true. You can be a healthy vegetarian. And we weren't saying people had to be a vegan or vegetarian, although that's possible. They, there's a big tent here. But there will be deficiencies in nutrients, and intake will not be adequate of vitamins. Now, when we put it all together, actually, lots of numbers, but it came down to something pretty simple, which was... For an omnivore version, about two servings of animal source protein a day, with daring being one. If you 
like dairy and some other animal source of protein being the other. And with red meat, not more than about once per week, but a couple servings of poultry, a couple servings of fish and a few eggs. So there's about, again, one plus one, pretty simple in the end. And I find that easy to keep in mind, uh, thinking about my own plan for a day or a week. So we have provided more nutrient analysis this time and show you can clearly have an adequate diet. But if you go more than much less than two servings a day, then you do need to think about fortification or supplementation for vitamin B12, especially that because there are serious problems that the vegan community ran into a few decades ago, but has become pretty aware that if you are going to be a vegan, you do need to take supplements or fortified foods. And the easiest way is just take a simple multiple vitamin that costs at the drugstore here less than 10 cents a day. The average person is starving their microbiome every single day, and in turn, robbing themselves of their best health. Enter 38 Terra's Daily Microbiome Nutrition, or DMN. What's DMN, you ask? Well, who better to explain than 38 Terra founder and gastroenterologist, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. Thanks, Simon. DMN is a daily prebiotic blend we created to nourish your gut microbes with exactly what they need to thrive. We used rigorously studied ingredients like actazin kiwi fruit powder and solenol resistant starch, both of which have been shown in clinical research to feed the beneficial bacteria, improve regularity, and support digestion and immune health. Of course, we left out the sugar and the unnecessary fillers that you find in so many other products. And what you end up with is the most complete prebiotic that I know of on the market today. In fact, this is the product that I've always wanted for my patients. Support your gut health today in the most practical, science-backed way with DMN. Simply head to 38terra.com. That's the numbers 38terra.com and use the coupon code, the proof at checkout for 10% off. 